I'm gonna I'm gonna start the recording and hopefully it won't um it won't you know make that noise every single time someone new joins. But anyway, okay, so let's go ahead and start with Charlotte. Okay. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I just threw the link for the slides into the chat so you can follow along uh, somewhere else if you'd like to. Um, and I thought I'd sort of start by introducing myself in case you don't know me. Um, my name's Charlotte Wickham. Uh, and if you don't know me, and if that made you wonder if I'm related to Hadley Wickham, uh, I am, he's my big brother. Um, I work part-time in the statistics department at Oregon State University, um, where I mostly teach and advise graduate students. And I also do some independent R training and consulting. Um, and I guess before I get any further, um, I am more than happy uh, if you want to interrupt me to take any questions as we go. Um, I'll also make sure we have some time at the end for that as well. And speaking of which, I'll just make a note for time so I don't go on for too long. <laughs> okay, um, so I spend a lot of my time teaching R, uh, but that also means I spend a lot of my time learning R. Um, and that's where I sort of wanted to, uh, I guess, start my presentation um, is really just sort of a reminder that like, we're all still learning. Um, things change so quickly in the R world. It doesn't really matter how far you are into your R journey, whether you're like just starting or you've been at it for, for years, it feels like there's always something new to learn. Um, so how do, I, how do I learn new R things? Um, this is sort of the way I tend to approach learning something new. Um, I generally start with an example, um, by doing an example with guidance. And by with guidance, I mean like I'm following a tutorial or I'm watching a video. Um, you know, occasionally I'm lucky enough to be sitting next to someone who's showing me. Um, but really an example where I know it's going to work. Um, then I try to take what I've learned from an example um, and apply it to something like I actually care about. Like how can the example I just worked through um, actually help me in things that I try to do day to day. And then finally, I feel like I've never really mastered something until I've had to teach it to someone else. Um, so that's sort of when I like I consider myself to have learned something uh, once I've taught someone, although that doesn't mean that sometimes I forget those things and have to relearn them. Um, so I think this is sort of my strategy for learning things, but it overlooks a one really important sort of prerequisite. Um, and, I, and I sort of think about it as the um, zeroth step, right? All of that requires me to know that the thing I'm trying to learn actually exists. Um, and I think that's um, sort of what I, what I kind of think about is like exposure. Like how is it um, that I get exposure to new things so that I know that maybe there's something I want to learn about. Um, and that's something I wanted to try and highlight um, in my talk today. So as a sort of a rough guide, um, I am going to tell you about the things I learned, uh, not quite this month, it's actually January. So that's when initially I sort of came up with this idea and I kept started keeping track of things that I learned. Um, so these are the things, some of the things that I learned in January um, that I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna talk about the visual editor mode in our studio, snippets in our studio, raw character strings, storing GitHub credentials in a better way than I was, uh, and the row-wise function in dplyr. Um, and I sort of have, I guess, multiple, uh, multiple goals for, for going through this. I'm sort of hoping that at the very least, um, if some of these are things you haven't seen, I'm basically giving you some exposure to some new things that you might want to learn. Um, even if they are things you have seen, I'm going to try and highlight sort of my journey to learning them or getting exposed to them, which might give you some ideas about how to get exposure to other new things. Um, and then I sort of have a, a third selfish goal and that like part of this is me teaching you these things and therefore I get to like check off my uh, learning strategy completion tasks. Okay, so um, sort of without further ado, I'm going to jump into some of the things I've learned. 
just gonna rearrange my screen a bit. Okay. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was the visual editor mode in R Studio. So this is, an, this is sort of an R Studio thing. Um, and it's a sort of new feature with markdown files in R Studio. There's um, a little button that looks a bit like a compass um, that you can activate whenever you're in a markdown document. And once you activate it, you basically are in the editor that's sort of more like a, what's commonly referred to as like a WYSIWYG editor or what you see is what you get. So instead of sort of seeing um, the source for, um, you know, inserting a code chunk, you actually see something that looks like a code chunk in a rendered document. You know, your section headings look like section headings. All the um, text formatting like bold or italics, that'll sort of looks exactly how it's going to in the final, um, the, the final rendered version. Um, and if there's one thing that I have found to be incredibly useful about this visual editor mode, um, it is tables there. So tables, making tables in Markdown drives me insane um, because it's tricky. So here's just a little example of me using the editor mode. I'm switching into editor mode and it has menus just like in, you know, something like Word, right? You could insert a table. It spits out something that looks like a table. You can edit it, um, you know, just tabbing through the cells like you'd be used to in Word or, or Excel or something like that. Um, and once you're sort of done doing that, um, I'm going to switch back here to the usual mode. And like it has done all that formatting for an, a markdown table for a markdown table for me, right? Like if you've ever had to do this by hand, like it, it's so annoying because you know you have to have pipes and you know you have to have dashes. Um, you always inevitably get one in the wrong place or like you need to make one cell a little bit longer and then everything's out of alignment and it looks in like a nightmare. Like if there's one reason to try visual, visual editor mode, try it with tables. Um, but there are obviously other cool things about it. Um, so how did I know about visual editor mode? Um, this was a new feature in RStudio 1.4. Um, but I hadn't heard about it. Um, basically, some point during the R Studio Global Conference, I saw a tweet from someone I follow. I cannot remember who it was, and I apologize to that unknown person that tweeted about it. Um, they were just like, oh, the new visual editor is really cool. And I was like, the what? Um, I had no idea what it was, right? So then I sort of Googled, led me down a, a path to this particular um, document I've got linked to here that. Uh, that's kind of how I learned about it. So um, I'm gonna kind of, we're gonna kind of just repeat what I did then a few more times, right? I'm kind of gonna show you something I think is pretty cool, try and convince you it's worth learning um, and then tell you how I got there. And then at the end of the talk, I'll sort of come back to these um, learning journeys uh, with some, some summary of what I think are useful ways to, to get exposed to things um, that are new in R and R Studio. Okay, so sort of next up on my list um, of things I learned was how to add a snippet to R Studio. So you may or may not have actually seen snippets in R Studio. So snippets are these ways to add chunks of code um, really quickly in R Studio. So I've got another little demo here. Basically, you type in a keyword and then you hit a shortcut. The shortcut I hit there was Shift and Tab. Um, and basically all this boilerplate content comes in as a, that's, that's the snippet. Um, so this particular example here is the shiny app snippet. Um, it's just a quick way to kind of get all the boilerplate you need for a uh, one file shiny app. So super useful if you're making a lot of shiny apps, you know you need that structure, you don't want to have to type it out every time. Um, as another example, there's a snippet for, it's called FUN, short for function. Um, type in fun, you hit shift tab, you get this boilerplate for defining a function. And the nice thing about snippets is that you can actually define sort of placeholders. So let me go back a little bit um, to when I first inserted the snippet. Oops, went the wrong way there. Um, 
it actually lets you tap tab through those places. So you can see I start with the function name. One tab takes me inside the parens after function where I can define the arguments and one more hit hit to tab takes me to the body where I can define the body. Um, so that's sort of a really nice feature of, of these snippets. If you sort of have a boilerplate and then you know you, you're gonna edit certain parts of it um, first. Um, so these are cool, like, an, and if you've never seen a snippet, like I hope now you have, and, and you might hunt for some that might be useful to you. Um, but the thing I actually learned in January was how to add my own snippet. So it sort of occurred to me that there is some code um, that I was constantly writing. Like basically every time I sit down to do something, I open up a new document, I make it an R markdown document, and then inevitably I insert a code chunk and inside that code chunk, I say library tidyverse, right? Like this is probably how I start 99% of my uh, coding documents. And I was like, well, I wonder if I could turn that into a snippet. Like how do I get that same functionality for my own code that already exists for shiny app and fun? Um, so how do you add your own snippet? Um, it's not too complicated. You have to go into your global options, it's under tools. Uh, and in the code section, there is this uh, menu box called edit snippets. So if you click on that, um, what you see is sort of on the right here is a snippet editor. Um, and you can see that there's sort of some different um, options, right? There's snippets for R documents, this or R code chunks, basically, when you're writing R. There's snippets for things like C and C++. Um, what I wanted was something I could throw into a, an R markdown document. So that's actually a, an, a markdown snippet. And this is exactly the snippet that I, that I wrote. So the way you define a snippet is you start with the sort of keyword snippet space, and then you give it the keyword you want. So I want to be able to type tidy, hit shift tab, and I want to see um, this chunk of code get inserted. And that chunk of code is setting up a code chunk. That code chunk has the name set up. I've set it to not give me messages because I tend to ignore those messages from the tidyverse anyway. Um, maybe, maybe not great. Um, and then library tidyverse, closing the snippet. So it's sort of, sort of entirely up to you. Like you can just put whatever code you want there. You can decide the keyword. Um, and you can see just in that example on the right, that RCPP snippet, that um, special syntax with dollar sign, that's sort of how you can define placeholders where people could tab into um, once they've got the snippet inserted. Um, and, and that's what I did. And I was super excited. I typed tidy, I hit shift, shift tab and up showed my chunk, right? Like now I can kind of get started on whatever I'm doing, like just a millisecond faster, right? And like, and that's, uh, I do this often enough that that millisecond like actually means something to me um, that was worth learning. Okay, so that's how to add a snippet to R Studio. So those were both sort of R Studio things that I learned. Um, oh, I forgot to tell you how I got there. Um, so I'd seen recommendations for using snippets. Um, and other learning resources. So things I'd come across when, you know, either I was learning, trying to learn something or trying to teach something. So I'd seen the shiny app snippet in the Mastering Shiny book. I know I've seen the fun snippet, but for the life of me, I cannot tell you where I saw it and I couldn't figure out where I'd seen it either. Um, but this was sort of a situation where like, I knew this snippets existed. What I didn't know was how to make one for myself. And it, it just sort of happened that one day I recognized I had a use case for this. That's what drove me to um, learn about it. Um, you know, and a Google search sort of led me to, to somewhere on our studio's website about how to do that for myself. Okay, so as I was saying, those are sort of our studio things. Um, this next thing is, is sort of a base R, new to me, new to R uh, thing. And that's this idea of raw strings. So um, you're probably familiar with character strings in R. Um, and in R, if you want a character string, um, you basically define it by putting double quotes around some text um, and you get a character string. 
You can use single quotes as well. Um, although, you know, R will also always sort of by default display the, a character string with double quotes. Sometimes you use single quotes because inside the character string you're trying to define, there are double quotes, right? And if you try and define a character string with double quotes and it's got double quotes inside, R basically gets confused about, is this a double quote inside the string or are you ending the string? So single, single quotes is sort of one way to get around that. And you can see when R sort of spits out the output here, um, it actually doesn't just show a, a double quote there, it does a backslash double quote. So the backslash um, in character strings in R is sort of an escape sequence. It's in this case saying, this isn't a quote closing a string, it's like literally a double quote. Um, so if you actually need a backslash in a string, you have to escape the backslash. Um, so if you want to have a slash in a string, when you're defining it, you have to sort of do a, a double backslash. And if you want two backslashes, you have to do four backslashes when you define it. So raw strings um, are sort of this introduction of new syntax. Um, so the way you define a raw string is you type the letter R, double quotes, opening paren, um, and on the end, you're going to close that paren and close that double quotes. But everything inside that, those parens, is going to be treated completely literally. So this is sort of why they're called raw strings. Um, which means if I'm trying to um, define the string that says or single quotes, um, I literally can just write or single quotes using those double quotes. And there's sort of no confusion. R knows what I'm doing. Um, it, what, it knows that I want this to be taken completely liter literally. Um, and that means it's like super nice when you're dealing with backslashes um, because you can just write the string as you want it to appear, right? If I want to say one colon backslash, like that's all I have to write. I don't have to worry about escaping this backslash and I don't have to worry about escaping uh, the backslash twice when I want to. Um, so that's what a raw string is. And um, I think when you look at these examples, you're like, yeah, okay, that may be cool, but like, why, why would I really want to use this? Um, and I think the best example I thought of for, for things that I've done um, comes with regular expressions. So regular expressions are sort of a way to pattern match strings. Um, and they can get super complicated. So there's a question on Stack Overflow that reads like, how do I validate an email address using a regular expression? Um, and this I have put in the slides here and it has a scroll bar because it's like really long. Like this is the answer to that question. This is the regular expression that apparently, like, don't ask me to verify, but apparently correctly identifies something as a valid email address. Um, so it's really long. Not only is it really long, um, there's a ton of backslashes in it, right? So if I wanted to use this regular expression with something like um, the string functions in base R, or I tend to use the stringer functions. So something like str under, underscore detect, which sort of um, just returns a true or false for whether a string matches a pattern. I have to provide the pattern as a string. And if I just provide it as a character string, I have to go through and sort of manually look for things that for I need to escape. So there's a backslash, I'd need to escape that backslash. Um, here's a whole lot more backslashes that I'd need to escape. Like there's a double backslash that's gonna need like, both of them are gonna need escaping, right? Like it gets tedious. So one really nice thing about raw strings is I could just copy this long, messy regular expression um, and as long as I put that sort of as a raw string, so I've got my R double quote open paren, right? And then everything after that is just a literal copy and paste from that um, Stack Overflow answer um, all the way to just closing the raw string, right? And if I look at that, you can actually see like R storing it as a character string, um, but it's done all the escaping for me, 
by specifying it as a raw string, I don't have to do any work um, with all the escaping. Um, and R has kind of done it all for me. So there's like, for instance, that double backslash that's escaping this backslash here. And then, you know, I could do it, you know, then I, then I use it basically, right? Like if I wanted to see, if I had a list of supposedly email addresses and I wanted to check if they were really email addresses, I might use string R, um, str underscore detect to do that. I pass in my vector of email addresses. I pass in this pattern that I've defined using a raw string um, and, I can, and I can do that. So um, there are, there's, some, there's some pretty cool things about that raw string. There's some, um, you can use variations in the syntax. Um, so I was using double quotes in a parenthesis, but you can use instead of the parenthesis, a curly brace or square brackets. Um, and it'll always work unless whatever delimiters you choose sort of actually appear in the string, right? Like if somewhere in my string, um, let me go back to my regular expression. If at some point in this regular expression, there is a paren double quote, I is gonna be back in the situation where it's like, oh, I think you're closing, you're finishing the raw string. Um, but there's kind of a cool feature where you can just add any number of dashes between the quote and the delimiter, like the paren, um, to sort of make sure that doesn't happen, right? You just keep adding dashes until that, that particular sequence never happens in your string. Um, and you can read sort of more about that. It's all detailed in the, the quotes help page in R. So how did I uh, learn about that? Um, it's, it was new in R. 4.0.0. So I could have read about it in uh, the other uh, news file that comes with every new release of R, um, but I, I hadn't. Um, it was sort of another case where I saw a tweet and it kind of led me down a rabbit hole. The tweet in itself was talking about um, native pipes possibly coming in R. So if you're familiar with the pipe um, that you know you use a lot in the tidyverse, there's sort of a uh, proposal to have a pipe that just comes with base R. Thought that was interesting. That kind of led me to the keynotes for USR 2020. Um, and I ended up sort of watching one of those keynotes. And it was just in one of those keynotes that, um, you know, they were talking about raw R strings. And I was like, oh, like, these are cool. Like, what can I use them for? Okay. I think we're doing, I think we're doing okay on time. Um, just keeping an eye on it though. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about um, was this idea about uh, GitHub credentials. So if you've used um, packages like uh, use this or um, GH, um, they have a lot of functionality in them to help you sort of manage um, your connection with GitHub. So, you know, ways to, you know, get your projects up onto GitHub or ways to um, get stuff down off GitHub. Um, but for them to work, you have to have some way of authenticating with GitHub, some way to sort of prove that you are who you are and that you have permission to make the changes you're making. Um, and if you've done that, you might have done it this way. This is certainly the way I, I had done it before. You have a file on your on your computer called .r environ that sets up environment variables that R uh, can access and know about. And the one that use this and GH look for is one called GitHub underscore pat. And you know you have in a string there a special token issued to you by GitHub. And I've X'd out all of that because if you had that token, you could make changes to my GitHub repos. Um, and there's sort of a downside to this approach. Like it, it should feel a little dangerous working this way because you literally have like what is considered sort of a password sitting in a plain text file on your computer. Um, and I think the danger there really is that like through some accident, you might accidentally push that to a GitHub repo, right? Like you might ex accidentally somehow make this file available 
to the general public, um, they would then have access to your GitHub and can, you know, cause all sorts of malicious problems. Um, but it's a common way to work. And like, I, I've done this for, for many years. Uh, and in fact, my R environment file is actually a lot busier than this one. Um, it has a lot of other variables that store similarly sensitive things. Um, but there is a better way to do that. So to sort of avoid that problem of having to store really sensitive stuff in a, in a plain text file, um, this particular solution is, is really just for your GitHub credentials. Um, but there's a, a function called git creds underscore set. It's part of the git creds package, but that's one of the packages that you get with use this. So, so you should have it. Um, and what's really nice about it is it actually leverages your operating system's method for storing sensitive information. So if you're on Mac, you're probably familiar with the keychain that sort of stores um, passwords for you and it's unlocked only with your master um, password for your, for your computer. Windows has a similar, a similar system called the credential manager. Um, and this function is super easy to use. You basically just run it and what you would normally be copying into your R environment file, you're just pasting in um, here and it sort of then stores that securely uh, in your operating system credential manager and whenever you use this or GH um, needs that information, uh, it can go ahead and get it. Occasionally you get sort of prompted for your, your password to unlock the, the keychain, but that's sort of the password you're used to using. So that, um, was something I didn't actually know about, right? I didn't know that this new function existed. Um, the way I kind of came across this is I use a function and use this called git underscore sit rep. So that's short for situation report. And that function just sort of spits out what use this uh, knows about your git and GitHub setup in your project. So it's really useful for just checking. Um, that you know, your, your local project's actually connected to some GitHub repo and which repo that is. Um, it's really nice when you're working with uh, forks and branches because it will sort of tell you, um, you know, is there an upstream repo that, that yours uh, points to? Um, you know, what branch are you on? Do you have push um, ability? That kind of thing. So I've used it, I, I use it quite commonly with my projects. And I had been ignoring for quite a while a particular warning that it spat out at me. Um, and the warning said, the token may be misscoped, um, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, whatever, things seem to be working. Like I can ignore this. Um, and one day, like it just got to me. I'm like, you know what? Like I probably should figure out what this is going on about and maybe fix it. Um, and just in going down that path of like, okay, like what do I, how do I get these new, new scopes? What do I need to do? Sort of came across then the use this article for the current recommendations about Git credentials. Um, and that, I mean, super well written article, like it was just like, okay, these are things you need to do. And one of those things was, hey, use Git code set instead of storing stuff in your R environment file. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, the rowwise function in dplyr. Um, and I think of all the, the sort of five things I, I've, five new things I learned in January, this is the one that I had known of for the longest, I had resisted for the longest, and I'm still not sure I'm completely, uh, I don't think I've completely mastered this one, but um, let's, Let's see if I can, well, so, so uh, let, me, let me say that this is, this is probably the one where I think trying to teach is very beneficial for my learning as well. Okay, so rowwise is a function um, that's gone through a few, few iterations, but was sort of, I guess in its current form, it came out in dplyr 1.0.0. Um, the way I think, is most useful to think about rowwise um, is sort of to, to compare it to uh, like group by. 
So I'm going to kind of walk through an example here just with a, a simple table. Um, and I've got that table here. So all it is is it's six rows. It's got one column called group. Group only takes two values. The first three rows have value one. Second three rows have value two. And then X, I'm going to kind of play with this column and mutate it. But, um, you know, it's just the numbers one through six. OK, so when you're using mutate in dplyr, the way I think is most useful to think about it is to think about the functions inside mutate getting the whole column. So I'm taking that simple table. I'm using mutate, so I'm adding a column. The column I'm adding is called rank. And the way I create it is I take the rank of x. Um, and the rank function just like literally turns ranks where one is smallest and um, you know in this case six is the largest number there's no ties so we don't have to worry about that so so when you look at that rank column I hope that kind of makes sense right we're just saying take this vector of six numbers and tell me what the ranks are um, and visually I, I sort of tried to show that on the right here right like I think about rank getting the whole column and I've sort of intentionally drawn it this way so that we've got our six elements. They're sort of sitting inside this box, just sort of like sitting inside the vector. And rank sees that entire vector, spits out an entire vector. That becomes our new column. So when you, when you think about group by, um, the way that that sort of changes that is by adding a group by to the statement, so the only thing I've changed here is I've added um, this line where I'm grouping by group, right? Just the first two lines doesn't change the data, but it does add sort of a signal to functions like mutate and functions like summarize. This is now group data and they should behave a little bit differently. And when you do that, now when we use mutate, um, Rank doesn't see the whole vector, right? Doesn't see the whole column. That column's kind of been split up by that grouping variable group. So kind of uh, in practice, like I've got this on the right, trying to, trying to do this visually, um, rank's kind of called twice, right? It's called on each of those groups. First time rank sees the vector associated with the, the three numbers in the first group. And then it's called again on the vector um, of numbers associated with the second group and they kind of get stuck back together that's what ends up in our column called rank so you can see um, you know now this column goes one two three one two three that's because when we look at just the first group the numbers one two three the ranks are one is the smallest two is the second smallest three is the largest when it sees the numbers four five six Right, just on their own, it says, okay, four is the smallest, gets rank one, six is the largest, gets rank three. Okay, so, so now what about row wise? Um, this is where I think it, it's useful to think about row wise like group by. Row wise is something you do to a, a tibble or data frame. It doesn't actually change the data, but it adds the signal to functions like mutate and summarize that says, hey, you've got to behave differently. The way you behave differently now is you do things by row. Um, and in practice, what that means is functions inside mutate are going to see one element at a time. So now rank is being called for every single row of the data and it only receives one element of the column. Um, and although sort of subtle, um, but it's important, You'll notice that these like are no longer uh, in a in a box, right? I've no longer got a one an element that's one inside something, um, and that's quite crucial. Like rowwise literally does sort of go inside that column and pull out each element and feed that to the function. And what happens when you want run rank on a single number? Like you always get the number one because you've only got one the number. It's the smallest. So in this case, you get kind of a column of ones not a particularly useful kind of use case, but I think, well, I hope helpful in kind of understanding what rowwise does. Okay, so what would be a useful use case for, for rowwise? Um, 
And this is where I, I'm still sort of collating examples where it's actually useful um, to me. So I'm not sure these are completely convincing yet, but, but these are some examples I came up with. So um, one way row-wise can be really useful is when you've got list columns. So for instance, the Star Wars data in, that comes with dplyr has this column called films. Um, and films is a list column. So that means that if you sort of extracted the column films, it would be a list. Um, and in this case, well, you can sort of see the, with the way that the tibble gets displayed, like each element in that list is a character vector. They're all of different lengths. So one thing you might wanna do is to find the length of each of those elements in films. Um, and that's an example you could do with row wise by sort of saying, okay, I want you to operate, sort of add the signal to operate row wise. Um, and then the mutate statement um, looks like this. It's creating this new column called n underscore films. And what it, I want to do is take the length of films. Um, and this is where without that row wise call, this wouldn't work. The reason this works is because of that row wise, that signal, mutate knows to only pass one element of films to length um, at a time. So I get the length of the first element, that's five, five. Then the second element, the length of that is six and so on. So um, that's one, I think really useful use case is if you have a list column and you wanna do something to each element in that list column, um, row wise lets you do that in sort of a really natural um, way. The alternative here would be to do mutate, but then also do a map or something from per. Um, this is just a little bit more elegant, I think, but you get, get there the same way. Um, the other sort of thing I think is useful here with row wise is actually to sort of create list columns. Um, so just as another example, here I am sort of getting myself set up to, to show you this. Um, I'm taking Star Wars, I'm just looking at two species, human and droid, and then I'm setting it up as a, a nested data frame. So uh, it's only got two rows, um, one for each of the groups and species, human and droid. And then the data column, this is sort of a nested, nested data, it's a list column. The thing inside each element here is actually another table. That table has all the other columns from the Star Wars data that aren't species. Um, so now this sort of looks like just a data set with some list columns, with one list column, the list columns called data. Um, and what I'm going to use, what I'm going to try and do is use row wise to create another list column. Um, so in this instance, uh, something didn't quite work there. Um, so I'm going to do two steps in one go. Um, right, so I'm taking that nested data and applying row wise. So I want to operate row by row. I want to operate once for the human row, once for the droid row. And the thing I want to create is a new column called model. The thing I want to do to each row is basically fit a linear model. That's what the LM function is doing. And this data here is referring to that data column in the in the um, in that nested table, um, and that creates sort of a new nested column called model. Um, the really nice thing is then that I can kind of then operate on that again. It'll be treated row wise, so I can sort of say, okay, for each of those models, I want to pull out the slope, um, and that's what's kind of happening here. So very roughly, like I'm kind of thinking about what's the relationship between height and weight for these characters. Um, what's kind of the slope of that relationship? What's the difference between humans and droids and droids have a much higher slope. Um, so that like I, my, like my, uh, this happens to me when I'm teaching uh, per too, like this feels to me like quite a complicated example. Um, so if you, if you feel like that all just went over your head, um, I totally appreciate that. And that's something that I'm still sort of trying to figure out like when 
And how is it easiest to learn about row wise? Um, and, and this, I think this is sort of gets reflected a little bit in my learning journey for Rowwise because I've known about Rowwise for a long time. Um, there were sort of these pre previews for Dplyr 1.0 um, that had talked about it. And I'd kind of skimmed through them like, oh yeah, this seems useful, but I didn't really sort of dive into it, into it and trying to apply it to things. Um, and what happened is I needed to teach, or at least I had put on a syllabus that I would teach uh, some iteration in a very beginning R class. So people that are pretty novice R learners. Um, and when I got to that, I was like, oh, maybe I can do this without per, and just talk about row wise. Uh, I attempted that. There's an unanswered question as to how successful that was. Um, so I'm still sort of figuring out the best way to teach row wise. It's sort of, I sort of have a reasonable mental model in my mind now, um, but it's sort of a completely different thing to teach it. Uh, but if you're curious, the best place to read about it is um, there's a, an article in, on the Dplyr website. Um, it's all about Rowwise and what it does. Okay, so those are, the, uh, those are the five things I learned in January. And sort of looking back on how I knew that these things existed, um, I kind of came up with three 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 uh, ways, I guess, of getting exposure. Um, the first is something I probably don't do enough. Um, I would probably learn about things earlier if I did. Um, and that is to re read the release news. So every time there's a new version of R Studio, new version of R or, the, or usually a new version of a package, right? there's news that goes along with it that says exactly what is new, what has changed since the last version. Um, so there's links here for the uh, RStudio blog, particularly the IDE tags, Tidyverse blog. Tidyverse's group is really good about always having a blog post when a new version is released, but often even leading up to that version, there'll be articles sort of previewing what's coming. Um, and then every version of R has an accompanying news file uh, that sort of details what's new in that version of R. The other thing uh, that I think is great for getting exposure is conferences. Um, and there's sort of the obvious like go to conferences. Um, it's a great way to get exposure. Um, but even if you can't attend conferences, there are ways to sort of use them to get exposure to new things. Um, so most conferences, regardless of whether the actual content is kind of streamed or somewhere public, they usually produce the program and the abstracts. Um, and just like skimming for interesting titles and then like stalking the author on GitHub is enough to like find the kind of content they're talking about. Um, and I think more and more conferences are being recorded and streamed and just watching them after the fact uh, is just as useful. The other thing I think is useful to sort of keep getting exposed to new things is just sort of staying connected with the R community um some of that sort of like like i get a lot of sort of uh exposure through twitter which i am a very intimate user user of but that's sort of enough um to get exposed to things i think meetups like this one are obviously great um and then i think finding you know find people finding people that blog that you enjoy reading is another way to kind of uh keep getting exposed to new things um, so I sort of would wrap up just with a few final thoughts. Um, and the first is, I think you have to find what works for you. For me, sort of reflecting on this, um, I would say my approach is sporadic, intensive R time. Um, and it's usually built around conferences. So, you know, it was really like our studio global happened to be happening in January. And that meant in January, I got exposed to a lot of new things. It also meant that, you know, I try to make conferences pretty, uh, uh, the words escaping me, um, right? I try and let them be all encompassing, right? For the time during the conference, my mind is on R and that means taking in new things. It means actually trying to learn a few new things um, that I've seen. I think other people have, have more success with kind of more regular scheduled 
learning. Um, so, you know, for instance, I know some people that subscribe to R weekly and they actually skim the table of contents every week. Um, I do not have that discipline, um, but, but you know, you, know you, you probably know what works for you. Um, I think another really important thing is like, you have to sort of give yourself permission and time to learn, right? That it um, sort of, you have to recognize that, that learning new things in, in your tools, R, R Studio packages, like that is an investment in future you, that the reason to learn them is that hopefully it's gonna make you um, more productive. Um, but you do have to recognize that it takes time to learn things. Um, and I think that's sort of my final point, which is like, pick your battles, like recognize that learning is hard and that doing something with a tool you have to learn will take longer than doing something with a tool you already know. Um, and particularly like when you're working to deadlines, sometimes you have to be like, look, this is just not the time for me to update my knowledge here. Like I'll do what I know. I know it works. I'll get it done. Um, and with that, uh, I'm at the end. So thank you. Um, and I guess I'm, you know, I'll ask questions. Thanks, Charlotte. So we have one question on chat. Mm -hmm. um, oh, we have two questions on chat. Uh, one question is, I know this may not apply to you, but how do you keep knowledge of R when you use it part time? And actually one related question, I know it's, it's usually bad form to ask multiple questions, but uh, I know one related question that I was thinking about is just kind of like, how do you kind of keep track of, you know, like of everything that you learn, right? Like, I mean, is it always project specific? So I think that they are sort of like very, very similar. So, you know, like how, you know, how do you just kind of like maintain, you know, maintain the knowledge? How do you kind of know how to, you know, find it again? Right, I think uh, that's a really great question. Um, both, both of those are great questions. So. Um, and you're right, like I, I use R like all the time, right? Like probably, I mean, not, I don't use it on the weekends so much, but like, otherwise it's probably daily, right? Um, but if I think about like, you know, I've, I've dabbled in things like JavaScript um, and Python and those I use very irregularly. And I inevitably have forgotten everything I knew about them when I come back to them. Right. So, so I kind of like, I appreciate that when you use something part-time, it's harder to keep track. It's just harder to uh, pull that knowledge back out. Um, when I do think about that, like one, like this, I think is an advantage of being someone that teaches a lot of R. When you teach things, like you have to document it somehow, right? Like that might be slides. It might be sort of a, like a tutorial uh, markdown document. Um, and it is not unusual for me to be like, oh, how does blah, blah, blah work? And I actually go back to the notes that I wrote when I taught somebody else and like reteach myself from those notes. Um, so I think it is key to document what you learn. Um, I am not particularly uh, good at doing that. Um, like I am not particularly disciplined about doing that with everything I learn. Um, but I do have the advantage that, you know, when I teach things, I have to do that. Like that's sort of a way to force you, force yourself to document it. So I think that's maybe like why my third step is in learning something is to teach it to someone else, because that often forces you to document what you've learned. And often, you know, sort of coming back to your own voice, um, it's easier to pick up things than sort of trying to review something that somebody else has written. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers both those questions, but. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's uh, definitely helpful. Do you have any preferred way of documenting things? I mean, if you're not just you know, kind of preparing them for a tutorial or for a class. Um, usually it's just a, a, an R markdown document yeah. somewhere, uh, hopefully in a project whose name like evokes what I was trying to learn at the time. <laughs> Um, so one other question on the chat was, it sounds like you are not fully comfortable with using row wise instead of per map. Just curious, are there any reasons or situations you would prefer per map to row wise? Also, thank you for sharing info about raw strings. Um, Addison found it very helpful. <laughs> because yeah. she's 
lot of time, you know, replacing backslash and forward slash and all that stuff. Um, I, that's, it's a good question about um, per and row wise because, you know, I sort of, right, I've sort of invested in learning per before I, before row wise was even around, right? Like per, I still is sort of my default way to approach some of those iteration problems. Um, I think, um, I think there are many situations in which row wise can replace uh, mutate combined with map. Um, and there are, there are some advantages to that. The, generally it's um, a little bit more concise in terms of code because um, once you've combined row-wise with mutate, you can kind of rely on mutate's special evaluation. So you can just refer to column names, um, which has always been a little bit trickier, I think, if you're using something like um, PMAP. Um, the downside that I've found so far is there are things I can do in PER that I can't yet do with row-wise. Um, so for instance, like quite a common thing I use in pair is the walk function. So the walk function lets you sort of iterate over things where you're not expecting any output. So usually you're expecting a side effect, like you're saving a whole lot of plots out to files, right? There's no real result that comes back to you. You're just creating the files on the disk. And there is no real alternative um, in that kind of row-wise realm to walk. So it's sort of, um, that's like, I think where my, my struggle is right now, like, is it better to learn per, which ends up sometimes being a little bit more verbose, but generally being sort of encompassing a wider range of tasks, or is it better to teach sort of row, teach or learn row wise, which lets you solve, you know, a smaller set of start tasks, but has quite sort of nice syntax. It's maybe a little bit more intuitive um, than, than having to combine per with mutate. So I, I guess I'm uh, still a little on the fence, but um, there are definitely situations where you would use walk that you just cannot get like a, a very nice solution with row wise. I once had a discussion with this uh, um, when I was first using learning tidyverse with Jenny Bryan and she does not like row wise. And so, and that was like, I was trying to iterate or something. And I, anyway, I just thought it might be interesting for you to know that, that she yeah. was strongly against it when I was first using learning Tidyverse maybe three, four years ago. <laughs> and it, yeah, I, I should ask Jenny about that. Cause I know, um, I know Rowwise has gone under some, a few iterations. So I wonder if it's the current iteration um, or a previous one uh, mm -hmm. in general. I have great respect for Jenny Ryan's opinion. So if that's the way she feels, it's a pretty strong recommendation against it. But I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll talk to her about it. See if I can dig into that. <laughs> Just thinking about this question, if it's okay to jump in. Of course. Yeah. Um, I have been using Rowwise because now I realize I have been misusing Mutate, um, <laughs> in the sense that I came to R from SAS, which clearly is not object oriented; operates very differently. Um, and I, I have that sort of intuitive training to always look for spreadsheets. And, um, and so in that language, often you can create new variables very easily, but by looking across, instead of you're treating, you know, you, as you said, mutate looks at the entire vector. Um, and so I have mis been mis misusing mutate to do things like create new variables that sum across a row. Um, and it's been great for me because this is, enabling potentially a bad habit that I've transferred from SAS. Um, it's, it has not been necessarily so great in the sense that this is more time intensive. Um, so it's very computation, computationally intensive. And so I, I, I now realize I need to probably do much more with PER to see if I can resolve that problem. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, um, this is something I uh, think is sort of quite, I think that distinction is quite interesting and important, like especially for people learning R, like being able to think in that kind of um, 
yeah, I, I guess it's when you're thinking about rectangular data and the tidyverse, like the usually the easiest path is some way to work with an entire column. Um, but depending on where you come from, like that is not very intuitive. Like a lot, a lot of people find it much more intuitive to think about, okay, I'm going to take the first row and I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to take the second row and do this. Um, but that, like, so that, I think the distinction between those two ways of thinking um, is sort of an important thing to think about um, and teach. I'm not sure I've quite figured out how to teach that, but, you know, I think, um, you know, in our functions that take a vector and return a vector of the same length are really common. Like that's sort of a common paradigm in R that's worth sort of embracing and, and getting used to that feeling of like being able to work on everything on a column at once. It's, it's really useful. We had one more question in the chat, which was who are some of your favorite R bloggers? Oh, that's a good question. I like, I'm like, I will admit that I am not the kind of person that subscribes to blogs. Like, I would say most of my exposure to blogs comes from people post, po posting about their blog posts on Twitter or when I'm randomly trying to solve some problem and I come across somebody's blog post. Um, But uh, yeah, but that, yeah, so I, I feel like I don't, yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Um, I mean, I could like list names of blog, people that write blogs, but then I'm not sure how useful that is because often they're so sort of topic specific, right? Like, so for instance, this is my first time making a sharing in slide presentation, which means that I have spent uh, a number of hours this week on blogs, <laughs> learning things that I didn't, didn't know how to do. Um, so it's like those people that write about R Markdown and Sharingan that are like at the top of my head right now. And then I will inevitably forget um, all the other great blogs out there. Um, so I don't know. I don't really have a good answer for you. I guess I sort of have curated, I guess I would encourage like creating, curating your own set of blog posts blog bloggers you like um, because I think certain certain people have certain styles that appeal to, to people in different ways the way yeah and, and that said the way I usually come across blog posts is through Twitter so you can go through her Twitter followers and figure out who blogs and follow the same people she follows and that's your answer <laughs> Yeah, that's one option. Um, you know, so, or, or, or hashtag our stats. Most uh, new blog posts end up there in some form or another. I don't know if anyone else has any questions. I maybe I'll, oh, go ahead, Susanna. I, I do have another question, um, which is, and so when you, when you do have this sudden new topic that you decide is worth learning and that you will invest time in learning, um, is there like a first hour in terms of like what, within the first hour of your deciding that you're gonna commit time to this, is it just like, massive Google short search or I mean like which I completely right. understand because I feel like that's my strategy uh, right. but do, is there an, sort of a process that you go through when you're trying to do that yeah um I mean I, I think it usually starts with a Google search it, it sort of uh, depends a little bit on what it is I'm trying to learn like if it's a if I've sort of identified it as a package that I don't know about that I want to learn about I usually start with um that packages documentation right like with with some caveats like sort of my my ideal is that they the package has a website and that website has a getting started vignette right and if and if i see that like if i get there within five minutes um i that's usually where i where i stay for a little while right like i kind of work through um whatever the package author has put together 
first. Um, and a lot of the, that time that works out pretty well, like occasionally you'll sort of get to a, or, you know, the package author written documentation is just like over your head, right? Like that they have written it as the package expert. Um, and usually that, that I think that's relatively apparent to me pretty quickly. Um, and that's when I might sort of leave that, that realm and like, a little bit more Googling for, for someone that sort of interpreted that documentation in a blog post or, um, you know, worked through a case study or something like that. Um, I tend to, tend to personally favor written things over videos um, only because it's a little bit quicker for me to get a sense if it's, the, if it's right for me, right? If it's got the right content. Um, but, um, you know, I think sometimes you can kind of gauge that from the first few minutes of a video as well, um, whether it's going to be pitched at the right level. Um, so that's usually where I start. And then, you know, like inevitably you work through somebody's documentation and it all works perfectly. And then you try and apply it to your own situation and like nothing seems to work. Um, and then it's sort of back back to Google, um, but then sort of more focused on, you know, things like Stack Overflow or our studio community where people have run into similar problems. Are there any error messages that you find particularly useless or particularly useful? Uh, that's a good question. And I don't uh, <laughs> Nothing. Let me think. I'm trying to think if I've had any examples recently. <laughs> um, nothing's coming to me off the top of my head. I feel like um, Yeah, and, and this is, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I sort of feel like I, I'm at a point where when I get an error message, either, I've either seen it before, in which case okay, that gives me a clue of what to do. There's like, I, or there's like enough clues in it um, that I can kind of figure out what's going wrong or like it's completely uninterpretable and then I just Google it, <laughs> um, which, you know, Probably, I don't know, I don't know. It'd be interesting to just monitor my error messages for one day. I suspect, um, you know, I get error messages all the time. Um, and I would say quite a lot of them fall into this, the first category, right? Like it's just me forgetting something. And then I like see the error message and I'm like, oh, that's right, you've got to do whatever. Um, but there's still certainly plenty of error messages that I end up Googling because I haven't seen before and they're not enlightening. Uh, I can't think of any great examples off the top of my head. <laughs> Okay, it's not, I don't know if there's any more questions. I'm just going to stop the recording.